Hi, my name is Kaylee Wheelis. I am one of four undergraduate students working with Dr. James Ingman and Mr. Michael Taylor to study a passage of interest within Secret Squirrel Cave. The title of our current project is Analysis of Secret Squirrel Cave, Tennessee, a presumptive chemo-autolithotrophic system supporting multiple trophic levels in a potentially sulfur speleogenic cave. I would like to begin by introducing Secret Squirrel Cave. Secret Squirrel is a code name for a cave located in the Highland Rim geological region of central Tennessee. The true name and location of the cave have not been disclosed at the request of the private landowner. It should also be noted that there is no record of petroleum drilling anywhere in the area. The cave was first entered in 2005 and has currently been mapped to over 15 miles. There is a stream that runs throughout a portion of the cave which empties into an overflow pond during times of flooding. This overflow pond is located within a passage of interest known as the Petroleum Passage because of its pervasive petroleum smell. The pond has a sandy bottom with dark patches, commonly referred to as mini vents, and these mini vents are ringed by bands of colored sediment. Occasionally, the mini vents will release globules of an oily substance dubbed tarballs by some cavers, and these tarballs will rise up to the surface of the water and burst, giving off the petroleum smell that the passage is known for. And then here are two of the mini vents that are commonly found on the bottom of the pond. As you can see, they are ringed by bands of colored sediment, not unlike those commonly found around the hot springs in Yellowstone. And then the two arrows point to larval salamanders commonly associated with the bands. And we will discuss these more later as they are extremely important to the project. I'd like to give a little bit of background about what we're studying. So photosynthesis didn't originate until about 2.8 to 3.2 billion years ago. Prior to this, the world was run by chemoautotrophs and looked very different than it does today. Instead of photosynthesis, where organisms take in sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water to produce glucose or usable energy, these chemoautotrophs took in inorganic compounds such as minerals and chemicals to produce the energy necessary to support life. And they are still prominent in unique environments around the world today, including hot springs, deep sea hydrothermal vents, and hypogenic caves. So most caves are formed by the force of air, energy, and water, forcing its way into the earth from above and carving out a passage. However, a few unique caves, known as hypogenic caves, are formed by liquid rising up from deep within the earth and carving out a passage that way. In caves that are hypogenic that are formed via sulfur speleogenesis. Hydrogen sulfide within the liquid is converted into sulfuric acid, which then eats away at limestone and leaves gypsum formation similar to this one seen on the right. This is one of the ones from Secret Squirrel Cave. And then because of the way they are formed, hypogenic caves function in the absence of photosynthesis and its products. And a couple famous examples of hypogenic caves include Mobile Cave in Romania, Lechigia Cave, and the Carlsbad Caverns. A little bit more about Mobile Cave. Mobile is actually the first reported chemoautolithotrophic cave system formed via sulfur speleogenesis. It has water of hydrothermal origin that provides it with hydrogen sulfide, methane, and ammonia, which not only was used to form the cave, but also supports the organisms living within it. Because of the way it was formed, Mobile does not receive photosynthesis or any of its products. However, it supports many different invertebrate species, including worms, insects, spiders, and crustaceans. 33 of Mobile's 48 invertebrate species are actually endemic to the cave, meaning that they are only found within Mobile Cave. And these invertebrates are supported entirely by chemoautotrophy. The system within Mobile Cave actually is similar to the system within deep sea hydrothermal vent ecosystems. So the chemoautotrophs are fed on by invertebrates, which are then fed on by larger invertebrates, and that is how the system supports itself. We believe this may also be what is occurring within Secret Squirrel Cave. Initial genetic sampling was conducted on May 26th of 2019. At that time, 30 preliminary samples were collected from sites that appeared to have a potential for microbial interest. And these included the tar sands, the water, and the tar balls. These samples were collected using sterile cotton swabs, which were then broken off into 50 milliliter sterile centrifuge tubes and capped to avoid contamination. 
And then the samples were transported on ice and stored at negative 80 degrees Celsius until they were ready to be processed. To date, nine samples have been processed using metagenomic sequencing techniques. And then if you look at the bottom left here, you can see five of the water samples that were taken on January 30th of 2021 by Dr. Hal Lev, and he is in this top left-hand photo taking one of the samples. When he went into the cave to take the sample, he actually said there were hundreds of laurel salamanders and thousands of cave adapted millipedes in and immediately around the pond. And we thought it was highly unusual that there were such high densities of these organisms since the passage was a mile and a half from a known natural entrance and a half mile from any artificial entrance. And because of the way caves function, it's unusual to see such high densities so far into a cave system. Which brings us to DNA purification and extraction. So DNA was extracted from the cotton swabs and then purified using the DNA power soil kit by Kyogen. And then it was quantified using a NanoDrop 2000 spectrophotometer. And that basically just tells you the quantity of DNA present within your sample. And then it was shipped off for metagenomic sequencing, which was performed commercially. And this brings us to metagenomic sequencing. So what metagenomic sequencing does is it takes the 16S RNA sequence of each organism in the sample and isolates it. And the sequence can be used like a barcode. So you can take it and compare it to other sequences present in the BLAST database, and then it will give you a percentage match, and that will be used to designate it to an operational taxonomic unit, or OTU. And an OTU is just a way to designate the organisms in the sample as different from the other ones present. Um, it's often difficult to designate them all the way down to the species level, so it just gives you an idea of what organisms are present there. And then 593 different bacteria and archaea were identified using this method, and of those, 232 were identified at the species level. Operational taxonomic units unique to a single sample is highest in B9, B10, and C2, or the colored concentric bands and the tar sand. This just means that they were the most unique compared to the other samples. If you look at C5, it had the highest abundance of different organisms, or the most biodiversity, and this is because of an ecological phenomenon known as an ecotone. So the yellow and white ring interface is in between the white ring and the yellow ring. It's where the two meet. So it gets organisms from both the yellow ring, the white ring, and then it has its own organisms that live only within the interface, and that's how the biodiversity is so high. And then unique taxa that were identified include those that can degrade hydrocarbons, are dependent on the metabolism of sulfur, methane, and ammonia compounds, and a couple of different eubacteria and archaea that have been previously associated with terrestrial and deep sea hydrothermal vents. So this slide shows all of the archaea as well as selected eubacteria that were identified from our samples. If you look at the ardenticate nallies, the methanopyrales, and the thermoproteus, they are all thermophilic or hyperthermophilic, meaning that they are heat loving. And these organisms are typically found in very hot environments. However, our samples were taken from a cool pond. So we believe it may be evidence that the water is rising up from somewhere where it's much hotter, where these organisms would thrive, and then coming up to the, into the passage and cooling, and that's why they're still present within our sample. If you look at the epsilon proteobacteria and the selected U bacteria, they are typically isolated from deep sea hydrothermal vents. And we thought it was really interesting that there were these deep sea hydrothermal vent organisms found in a cave in Tennessee. This chart was modeled after Dr. Diana Northrup's from the Lechegia 150th Mile Celebration. What it does is it breaks up each sample by the different phyla present within the sample and shows it as a percentage of the whole. What a phylum is, is a higher taxonomic classification that shows groupings together of organisms with similar characteristics. So if you look at B10 and C2, or the yellow ring and white ring, they have many of the same phyla present, meaning that they have many organisms with similar characteristics. If you were to adjust the levels of a different phylum within each, then you would see that they are almost identical. However, because there are different amounts and there are different organisms present in each phylum, then they have variation. 
This slide shows a comparison of a typical petroleum sample to the secret squirrel petroleum sample using GCMS or gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Basically what happens is you put the sample into a machine and it is heated continuously over time. So as more time passes, the sample is heated to higher and higher heats. You can see on the bottom here that they are all on a time scale. So this means that the less complex molecules come apart more easily and they are present on the left hand side because they require less heat and less time. And the more complex or harder to break apart molecules are on the right hand side because they require more heat and more time. Each peak represents a different compound that was present in the sample. And the height of the peak is representative of the quantity of the compound within the sample. So if you look at this typical petroleum sample, it's very spread out. There are many different peaks and the carbon chains are typically 14 to 18 carbons long. But if you look at the bottom or the secret squirrel sample, these peaks are not as spread out. They're not present in some areas where they were in the upper graphic. And typically the carbon chains are about five to 10 carbons in length. We believe that this may, sample may have been degraded by the hydrocarbon degrading organisms present in our samples. In summary, microorganisms capable of degrading hydrocarbons, oxidizing sulfur, methane, and ammonia compounds, and thermophiles, hyperthermophiles, have been reported in the passage. Recently, cavers reported hundreds of salamanders and thousands of cave adapted millipedes in and immediately around the pond. And this is unusual because caves typically do not have higher densities of organisms so far into the cave. The petroleum passage is a mile and a half from a known natural entrance and a half mile from an artificial entrance. And this is so unusual because organic carbon is usually only available at the cave entrance and where water carrying organic material is available. However, these densities have been reported in chemoautotrophic caves, including Mobile Cave in Romania and Melissa Tripa Cave in Greece, where densities of up to 200 pillbugs per square meter have been recorded. Large gypsum formations not typically found in the eastern United States are also present within the cave. They have been recorded in caves of sulfur speleogenic origin, including Mobile and La Chiquilla, and now in Secret Squirrel. Our discovery of potentially sulfur and methane-driven cave microbial communities could offer a new example of a type of system that has been suggested as a potential model for life within subsurface environments on Mars. More study is necessary to support the hypotheses of sulfur speleogenesis and chemoautolithotrophy within Secret Squirrel Cave. We would like to conduct salamander and invertebrate identification and population estimates, further genetic analysis, and quantify the passage of energy through trophic levels using isotopic analysis. We'd like to use 13C isotopic analysis to see if the millipedes in the passage are isotopically light. According to Dr. Sherban Sarbu, who has recorded similar results within Mobile Cave in Romania, if the millipedes are isotypically light, it's a good indicator that they are feeding upon uh, the chemoautotrophs in the passage and that chemoautotrophy is supporting the energy flow within Secret Squirrel. We'd also like to analyze the gas emitted from the tar sands, develop a better understanding of the geology of the cave strata, and conduct time-lapse photo documentation of seasonal or other changes within the pond. So every time they go to the pond, these dark patches or mini vents seem to be in a different location around the pond. They seem to move. So they would like to see if there is some sort of pattern to that. And they would also like to see if there is a pattern to the salamander and millipede population. So when they first entered the cave, there were not many millipedes or salamanders present. But when Dr. Hal Love went to collect the water sample, he said there were hundreds of salamanders and thousands of cave adapted millipedes in and immediately around the pond. And he thinks that this may be due to seasonal variation within the cave, and the time lapse photo documentation would, be, would allow us to view this. We would like to thank Dr. Matthew Nye Miller, Mr. Eric Pollock, Dr. Hal Love, and Mr. Joel Buckner for their technical assistance, as well as Ms. Haley Jackson, and once again, Dr. Hal Love and Mr. Joel Buckner for their photography. We would like to thank Dr. Sherban Sarbu for his advice, and Ms. Brianna Horton for everything she has done as a performer research student. 
We would also like to thank the Henderson State University McNair Scholars Program and the Arkansas Student Undergraduate Research Program for their support of our project. Lastly, I would like to thank my amazing research team. Pictured from left to right is Maya Robles, Kaylee Wheelis, Aspen Huseman, Lauren Camp, and our former research partner, Brianna Horton. Dr. Ingman and Mr. Taylor are not pictured, but they have also been a huge help to the project. I know with the presentation being online, it's difficult to submit questions. However, if you would like to email me at the email below, I would be happy to address any questions or comments you may have. Thank you.